All right, students, welcome back to chapter four, requirements engineering. Anytime we are initially developing a system, the system analyst or even the project manager needs to come up with a requirements list. Well, we briefly talked a little bit in chapter three, but these are requirements that the end user needs. Uh, chapter four, page 105, gives a couple examples of types of requirements. So let's look at, uh, it's the third one down. The contract management system shall generate a daily reminder list for all sales representatives. So here, the customer has said that, hey, I need this reminder to be generated automatically. Sounds simple enough, but when we expand upon that, we need to figure out what are all the inputs? What goes in to building this list? What kind of reminders are these? Is this an email? Do we want it to be a pop-up in the program? Does it need to send a text out to their phone? So a lot of these requirements can be more complex than what they originally seem. And most importantly, it could change the scope of the project. Anytime we change the scope of the project, we run into the issue where we might have to delay delivery times or increase cost for our customers. The example we just talked about is a service. This is a functional requirement. These are some things that this system is going to generate. It's something the system is going to do. Non-functional requirements are really of constraints. I need 30 users to be able to use this simultaneously, right? And that's big, especially if we're talking about licensing. If we have a system that we're going to license to 100 users, well, great, that says that at most, you know, we're going to have 100 copies of this out in the organization, but I need 30 people to access it at the same time. That gets tricky, especially when we're talking about large databases. That's a lot of information. And honestly, even though the software might be capable to do it, is the infrastructure, is the actual, are they wired, are they hardwired? Do they have enough bandwidth to take care of that in-house? That's a non-functional requirement. Another non-functional requirement, and honestly a pet peeve of myself, is making sure that the system looks and feels uniform. That if there is a color scheme, we make that the whole way across it. The fonts, the whole way, buttons are the same thing. I want to make sure that what we deliver is, one, visually appealing, but it just works. It's a good design style. The book lists security as additional considerations, and in all honesty, I recommend this should be your top concern for any system, regardless of its end use. Making sure that you have a very robust system that is capable of withstanding decent uh, penetration attempts. You know, nothing's going to be bulletproof, and we can't put a lot of time or effort into a smaller system, especially if the price isn't there. But we do have to make sure security is addressed, and we have to communicate that with the customer to ensure that the rest of their IT infrastructure is up to snuff. Another thing that people often overlook is total cost of ownership. A lot of time, customers will request a system to be built uh, and expect, you know, that 80, 90, $100,000 quote that is given is the end of it. Well, there might be upkeep to that. You might have to have patches or updates to make it still compatible with the ever-changing online world. But also, there's other things. You, let's we'll talk about that database we talked about earlier saying, I have 100 licenses but 30 simultaneous users. That really isn't that challenging to overcome from a software standpoint. But the end user needs to understand that the rest of their hardware needs to be up to snuff. Do you have enough bandwidth in your internal network? Do we need to upgrade you? Are you just using basic wireless or basic CAT6? Do we need to look at fiber optics? Do we need to look at upgrading your machines? Do you have enough RAM to be able to access this information uh, quickly, efficiently, or even at all? So you really... You have to do your due diligence, especially if you're working with customers that have no IT, no internal IT, or are just lacking in knowledge of it. Uh, it makes you a, a better person to deal with. It makes you more reputable, uh, and that's how you get returning customers and referrals.
when you have a project kickoff meeting, you'll sit down with a lot of the stakeholders, maybe the program manager of the company you're working with, maybe some of their IT staff, maybe one or two of their analysts. And if you're lucky, um, somebody who actually is going to be working on this system. And when we're gathering requirements, this is, in my opinion, this is where a lot of the fun begins. You know, you do the, the who, what, where, when, and why of these requirements. I like doing interviews. I think that is incredibly effective. The hardest thing is determining who to interview, if you can interview them, and if they're willing. And you want to try to do this at all stages. Look at every possible user and every possible user role, because the individual inputting the data has different needs and wants than the individual getting the output of that, or a supervisor, or maybe somebody you know two or three tiers out. I like to have a set of questions that I ask everybody, regardless of their position, regardless of their title. Uh, and then from that, you can kind of go off and th this is where it really helps to have people skills and be able to ask leading questions to understand. Because a lot of times when you're dealing with customers, they think they have an idea of what they want. Oh, I want this database to be able to pr produce these results for me. And that's fine. And a lot of times that's correct. But try to probe leading questions to see if there's other ways to accomplish this, if there's other information they need, or maybe what they think they want isn't what they really want. And some of this stems from maybe their lack of knowledge with software uh, or just lack of knowledge with how the system works or how they think it would be work. So, you know, try to really convince them that the requirements they're asking for are needed and definitely fill what they want. And then you need to ask the right questions. Um, it says here, consider both formal and informal structures. This is really great because you get different data from these. When you have a formal session, you will bring everybody into a conference room, we'll have a PowerPoint up, and we'll start talking about it. And that's great, but you don't really get a lot of candid responses. After this, it's nice to have breakouts and maybe go to somebody's cubicle and see what they're doing now, see how they're accomplishing their job now, talk about the requirements, what can we do to make life easier for you? A lot of times when you convince customers, especially the people who are doing data entry, really um, you know, labor intensive tasks, if you come off as somebody, hey, I'm going to make your life easier. What can I do to make this job easier, better, more enjoyable for you? A lot of times that's when, you know, their light bulb kind of turns on and they're willing to be more talkative and really give you uh, some good gouge on the exact data they need, how they need to process it, and just in general, what can make their daily job easier. Don't take a lot of their time. When you are going into a customer space, even if even if it's in your company, maybe you're just in a different department that develop, develops uh, software, develops products. But when you're going into another department space or customer space, you're on their time. Even though you know this is going to better them and it's going to give them the the software program they want, we don't want to be a nuisance. We don't want to be a bother. Um, make sure you prepare ahead of time. You have all all your ducks in a row and you're ready to go in there, knock out the interviews and get out as quick as possible. Now, now that being said, there's nothing wrong with coming back again, doing a follow on interview a, a day or two later. Don't overstay your welcome, but make sure you have enough time on site to accomplish what you need to accomplish. Document review and observation can be incredibly useful. If you look at past documents, basically how your customer is doing the job now. That really gives you insight in what they're doing right and what could be approved upon. And a lot of times, especially if they're working with order systems or even just paper systems, there's still a lot of companies that rely heavily on paper anymore. If you can mimic a lot of that old system in the new system, you can mimic the format of that paper form. If you can mimic 
some of the features of that out-of-date system. It makes implementing your new system so much easier because things are familiar to them. Um, you can also get a lot of that from observation. You can learn a lot by just shadowing somebody, sitting behind them, watching them do their job, taking notes. You don't really need to be talking to them to say, hey, let me just let me let me watch how you do things. Um, and, and again, you you see their habits, you see the information they need. Uh, and then from that observation, you can immediately go into a brainstorming with that individual and say, hey, I, I see I see this this current task you're working on seems to be taking a really long time. Uh, why is that? What do you think? And, and you get a lot of really unique perspectives when you do that. And there are a plethora of tools out there, both free, subscription based, or you just buy the whole suite of tools. So many things out there to help you make this better. Uh, you know, you could just do all this in Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and you will be fine, and that will work great for you. Um, you know, if you wanted to kick it up a little bit, we can get really great modeling tools. You can start throwing in Grant Gantt charts. Um, you know, you can have really, you know, exploding pie charts with 3D graphics, and and, and that's you know, it does it doesn't matter, right? At the end of the day, use the tools that work best for you and help you get the job done. Uh, but shop around even if you are set into like for whatever reason I I love Microsoft project I know it's not the most intuitive uh, Out there, but I've been using it so long. I, I just get it. I love it. It works for me uh, But every couple months I try I try something else There's nothing wrong with checking out different options out there uh, at the very least That's just something else in your toolbox something else to kind of change your thinking of where you want to go uh, so constantly be on top of the changing trends out there. That's going to wrap it up for Chapter 4. Keep on pushing. If you have any questions, please let me know.